All right, welcome, folks. Today, I've got a special guest here, Adam Myrie from the Hama Association, who's the Chief Operations Officer. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you very much for having me. So we're going to talk about historical African martial arts, a really fascinating topic because there isn't a whole lot out about it. There is, you know, aside from the Hama Association, is on YouTube, I'm only aware of one channel that does it, Damon Stith, who is the president of the Hama Association. And uh, I'll put links down below so you can, can check that out. And um, yeah, so we're just going to have a bit of a chat about it. So first off, what I would like to ask you is, when did you get into it? How long has it been? And uh, how did you get into it? So I actually got involved in historical African martial arts. Um, technically, you could say a few years ago, because uh, several years ago, maybe, I believe maybe 2013, when I did some pop wear classes. Um, but that was, you know, neither here nor there was more fitness. But to actually seriously get into historical African martial arts, this was the result of a book that I wrote um, and published last year. <laughs> Um, I, I'm not going to turn this into an ad for my book, but um, it's basically, the premise is basically kind of like in terms of Lord of the Rings, but in an African context. And so in order to be true to the environment that I was creating, the world building aspect, I had to do some research. Um, hmm. And through that research, that's where I ended up coming across Damon Stiff. Uh, that's how I ended up getting into learning about some of the living and past arts, the weaponry, etc. And that, I used that to inform the way that I wrote my battle scenes in my book. And part of the research was getting into the practice. And the rest is basically history. What would you say, what's the thing you enjoy the most about practicing and studying Hama? I'll, I'll say a couple of things. The first is, um, well, the Historical African Martial Arts Association has a two part mandate. The first part is the martial arts and the second part is military history. Hmm. So being able to not just study the arts, but learn about them in context uh, is very fascinating to me. Um, it's great for personal development uh, hmm. in terms of, uh, to give you an example, I started practicing uh, modern tahti, which is an Egyptian stick fighting form, uh, about two years ago. And it was actually part of my recovery from a really bad car accident that I was in. Mm. Um, and it really helped with mobility, fitness, it got me off walking on a cane, um, it really put me sort of back into the body that I had before the accident. And so uh, there's that as well, so it's, it's several things, the, the personal development, the fitness, the history, and discovering something that, in my view, even through my African Studies programs at university, uh, were just not covered. So. Mm. This, that, it's, it's all of those things. It's interesting that that's pretty much what I would say too. It's all those things, you know, it's the, uh, the historical aspect, you know, connecting with a part of what was life to people back then. And also, of course, fitness, you know, it's, it's just such a fun form of exercise because you're learning a skill as well as developing your body. Absolutely. I mean, it's the same reason that anybody would get into karate or kung fu yeah. or Muay Thai kickboxing. It's just a different art. What I've been wondering about is what are the sources? Like, how do you go about reconstructing African martial arts? Is, is there a living tradition? Well, it's a mixture of things, actually. Mm. So we have three aspects of it. If you get a chance to look at our website, we have a whole section that explains uh, our research as well as a list of some of the sources we've been using. Um, so we have primary sources, and for us that includes people who practice living arts. For example, um, I studied modern tahtib under Dr. Adel Bulad, who did his own reconstruction of the stick fighting art um, through traveling across Egypt and then pulling out the martial principles of the dance. Hmm. Uh, you also have uh, secondary works. So these would be uh, translations like the Mamluk Lancer from the University of Oslo. Uh, it's a great book on spear fighting on horseback and on foot. I would definitely recommend reading it. It's more of an essay, but I recommend reading it. It's available for free online. Uh, the second part is, um, so we're looking at translations, for example, uh, the Mamluk Lancer from the University of Oslo, the uh, uh, Muslim Manual of War. Uh, we're also looking at accounts uh, from European explorers who went into Africa, went to war with people, um, lived with people for a while, experienced uh, experienced context. Um, 
We also have uh, some books that we're trying to get translated. Right now, we've got a Kickstarter running for a book called The uh, the Art That Encompasses All, or The Treasure That Encompasses All Arts. It's a Mamluk manual from 1470. Uh, we're working on getting that translated from classical Arabic to English so that we can make it widely available for everyone. Um, hmm. So hopefully if we can uh, get our Kickstarter with uh, enough funds, we're about 500 British pounds away from completing it. Uh, hmm. Then we'll be able to make this available for everyone by next summer. Um, okay. So that's uh, so. Th- those are our sources. So we have people who practice the arts today. We have translations from accounts, and we also have well, we have records of battles as well, and we also have actual texts. Hmm. If you g- give me the link, I can actually put the link to the fundraiser in the video. That sounds really awesome. Perfect. I'll make sure to send that to you uh, mm-hmm. after we're done. You know how Avatar, the last airbender, got around that? Uh, they had the artists practice the moves to best animate it. Yeah, I mean, that's that can really be helpful sometimes when whenever you're, you're doing fiction to just see, uh, instead of just making something up, okay, th- this is how the character moves, and just look at how people actually move, you know, real martial artists, and then modify that and, and fit it whatever setting you have. If you think about it, there are some martial arts that are completely developed based on the context that, that the people lived in. Um, a really good example I'd like to use is, is Tati, because... Uh, with Tati, there's a very similar stick form throughout East Africa uh, that's used in Ethiopia among the um, among the Serma people uh, doing Donga. Uh, you also see it in northern Ethiopia. You see it in some places in Sudan. And a lot of it comes from boys who were just shepherds out in the field. And they also needed to be able to fend off hyenas or wild dogs or whatever mm. from the flocks. So, I mean, uh, it, it, it is very much contextual. So to be able to put that into your book you're able to say what are the principles of the lives that these people are living and you know to make it more immersive real other than capoeira could you give a quick rundown of other amas if you take a look at capoeira which i think um oftentimes is is very misunderstood uh capoeira itself isn't um is more a a training tool for martial arts Hmm. the actual combat version of capoeira is capoeira gem which is actually used on the battlefield Hmm. um this included forms with machetes, what they call makulele. Oh. Um, there's also a knife fighting form that's involved as well in capoeira. Um, it's not as popularly taught. Most people, when they see capoeira, they usually see a version that's called capoeira regional, which is a style that is very you know, jumpy, flippy. It's very difficult at. Um, mm. But a lot of the, but when you actually take it and apply it to a martial context, uh, a lot of the jumping and the dancing is stripped away and it's replaced with its principles so the principles of level changes the principles of being able to use your whole body the physical fitness that's applied in it or tahti or modern tahti uh is for is basically a template for pole weapons what you find very commonly in african martial arts overall is that they start with the stick but the stick is a template for multiple weapons so um if you can take the techniques of tahti and apply it to spear fighting and you can apply it to fighting with a two-handed axe Mm. Uh, you can also take the techniques from al Matreg and apply that to saber fencing. You can apply it to fighting with, uh, with the Taba or the uh, Persian or Arab battle axe, um, war hammers. Uh, you also have uh, styles like Ubumi, which is Zulu stick fighting, mm. which can be used to train for fighting with the shield and the swallowtail axe, or the shield and the Ishwa, which is the famous Zulu stabbing spear. Um, so there are there are various various weapon forms. There, there there are a lot of them. Some are designed for armored fighting, and some of them aren't, depending on the martial context of the of the culture. What weapons are commonly used during duels in African martial arts? So it depends. A lot of the duels historically have been done with sticks because mm-hmm. generally it was a settled dispute. Um, I always bring up uh, tahti or modern tahti because it is uh, it's the oldest example. Um, up until the early 20th century, uh, duels were fought using the sticks. Uh, full contact tattoo was banned in the early 20th century because a lot of people ended up getting killed from getting hit in the head. Hmm. So they had to stop that. Um, it's the same thing with uh, Zulu stick fighting, um, also called Nguni. So you see it among the, the Ashtosa people, Zulus and, and Bendas and other people. Um, they'll also do with sticks as well. Duels to the death were not that common. It was usually duels hmm. to first blood. And then when you when first blood was struck with a stick, uh, that, that was sort of the end of it. Uh, you see the same thing in the West Indies. There's a style called Kalinda, which is a stick fighting form um, brought over by slaves from West and Central Africa. 
And uh, it's also uh, done every year in a duel, but it's done with a stick, and usually the fights are done the first blood or knockout. But there are hundreds of different styles. You have mm. kickboxing styles from Madagascar, Blood Moor Genki, which is very similar to Muay Thai kickboxing with a few changes. Um, it's generally an unarmed form of fighting that trains you for armed fighting because a lot of the strikes can be done with a weapon in hand. Mm. You have um, uh, Lam, which is actually a very popular style of wrestling in West Africa. It's it, you should. There's a great documentary on Vice about how they were able to turn it into a very uh, lucrative uh, industry in Senegal. Um, it's fantastic. I, I, I do recommend you check that out. In North Africa, you have I mentioned before Alma Treg. In um, Sudan, you have Nuba Wrestling, which actually goes, which actually dates back to ancient Egypt. Uh, you have um, Musungue, which is a boxing style in South Africa. So there are hundreds of different styles of martial arts that come up in continental diaspora. Mm. This is also worth uh, pointing out that a lot of people, I think, underestimate the diversity. Like they think Africa as if it's one country, even though it's a continent with a whole lot of different uh, geographical areas and different countries and different cultures, etc. I mean, we say historical European martial arts, that, but this is, this is not one system. It's, it's a number of different ones, Italian, German, uh, and also the different time periods, like Renaissance, rapier fencing, of course, is a lot different than medieval longsword. Uh, as you mentioned, you're, you're not going to say that Pancration and you know fighting in a hoplite phalanx is going to be the same would take the same training as mm. learning how to do 19th century saber fencing it's just not the same thing yeah and that's very much the situation with african martial arts as well um i mean historically or recently there's kind of been a phenomenon of people who um, and i don't want to name any names because i don't want to be disrespectful to anybody but there are people who will for example take martial arts like kung fu throw a dashiki on it, play some drums, and then say that that's African martial arts, mm. which doesn't really do a service to the hundreds of different styles that do exist. Um, and as you mentioned before, people tend to look at Africa as a monolith, not realizing that it's a continent where over 3,000 languages are spoken, with uh, thousands of different ethnic groups, um, centuries upon centuries of different kingdoms that often warred with each other. Um, and, you know, it's just like any other place, just like Europe, just like... Uh, you find great diversity in both the cultures and the way that they used to beat each other up. And also, of course, you have to keep in mind the difference between uh, battlefield combat and dueling. Do you know anything about that And as far as African martial arts are concerned? It, again, depends on the culture. Um, mm -hmm. Most of the martial arts are geared towards battlefield combat. Many of the cultures value the individual warrior's prowess. So the arts themselves would would be part of the training was learning how to fight on the battlefield against multiple opponents. Um, in modern Tartiva, as an example, um, there is a there is a, uh, a specific there are several principles on how to protect yourself because the the idea is if you're on a battlefield you're not going to be attacked by just one person. The fighting is almost never linear in most African martial arts. You will always find that there's a lot of circular movement uh, and a lot of hit and run. Uh, you see a lot in um, in arts like um, in Matraig, uh, in, in the stick fighting form, you'll find that they do a lot of circular movement where it's always getting behind your opponent and getting at the next person, getting past this opponent, getting to the next person, mm. disabling this opponent and moving on to the next person. Um, the only arts where you really find people are focused on dueling are usually wrestling and pugilism. Again, that's similar in, in European martial arts as well, where you have, uh, for example, Viking wrestling, which is uh, basically about you wrestle them to the ground and get away from them so one of the others can stab them or what have you. So it's, it's quite a different fighting dynamic if, if you have other people uh, as well to rely on. Like sometimes, for example, just being able to bind up somebody's weapon and allow the person next to you to attack them, that's sometimes all you need. In a duel, that wouldn't get you anywhere, of course. You see that principle a lot in West African wrestling as well, where the goal isn't necessarily to wrestle your opponent to the ground and then submit him. The goal is to knock him down. Mm -hmm. And once he's down, if he's down and you're up, then... Well, you know the, the logical conclusion on the battlefield, mm -hmm. and so that's generally how it is. Because if you're still on your feet, if you're rolling around with this person on the ground, and then you kill him, now you have to get up, yeah, and hope nobody's behind you with the sword. 
You speak about on the dueling style where the combatants are armed with a stick and the other arm is bound in rope. So there's one style where people do have one arm that's bound in rope, and uh, that is dambe. Uh, that is a boxing mm. style from uh, from West Africa, most popularly done among the Hausa tribe. Um, that is actually an interesting, um, as I mentioned before, a lot of the, similar to Filipino martial arts, you'll find that a lot of the empty-handed techniques can easily be applied to weapon work. So um, in Dambe, you have one hand that is exclusively used for defense, hmm. and this is called the shield. That's a shield hand. And then you have another hand that's bound in cord, and that's called the spear. So the idea with this is that your left hand or your outside hand is out and is supposed to stop any incoming strikes that are coming that are coming from your opponent. And then your weapon hand, which is wrapped in cord, is used to strike. And beyond that, it's very similar to most bots and matches. Uh, but you can easily put a shield in the left hand, put a put an attacking weapon in the right hand, and use the same techniques. There are probably a number of common misconceptions that you run into. Like if there are new people who start practicing, they, they ask certain questions, just like in, in HEMA, I'm assuming. Some of them are, a lot of them are, are basically born on the idea that uh, certain things just did not exist in Africa. Uh, a great example is armored fighting. Mm. Um, so a lot of people don't realize when people think of the archetype of the African warrior, usually this, of course, is thanks to film. They imagine some naked guy with a, with a poorly made spear. Hmm. But you have cultures across the continent, especially in the north and north, the west, and the east, who have complex armor. For example, uh, there's a there is an armored jacket similar to a gamison that's called a jibba uh, that was worn in Sudan. Um, it was actually, there are some examples, I believe, in a couple of the museums in, in the UK uh, from the Modest Rebellion in the 19th century. Um, so there's those, you have the uh, horsemen of the Borneo Empire who wore chainmail to battle. Um, then you have the Mamluks and uh, the other Berber warriors in North Africa who had, you know, breastplates, who wore complex helmets, uh, who had their version of gauntlets and all these other styles of uh, styles of armor. So throughout the continent, you see that. But again, most people have that concept of the naked guy running into battle with a spear, and so that uh, that's one of the misconceptions that we deal with a lot. Another one in, from the other end is that Egypt created everything, which is not true. I mean, it was a single civilization that was very influential, but. Uh, Egypt wasn't the end, wasn't the genesis of everything. A lot of these different styles developed independently, or uh, may have crossed over over time. But Egypt was not the only civilization in that period. I mean, you know, Carthage is a, is a great example. Numidia was known for its horsemen. Um, uh, Dambe is what I was thinking of. Also, whenever my friend and I play Civilization, we always play the Zulu Nation because they're badass and we love their armor designs. Yeah. I've been doing some research on Carthage um, during the First and Second Punic Wars, and it turns out that they had... Um, I have to double-check my sources on this. I'm still working on my paper, but um, there seems to be an indication, at least, that they got a lot of their iron from a West African civilization called the Nok, who hmm. were some of the best iron smelters of that particular era. So they were selling, you know, weapons grade iron to Carthage to fight war. I mean, these are things that don't necessarily, you know, get covered. And part of the problem as well, when you look at the forces of the 19th century, there was a vested interest in their narratives to uh, paint the continent a certain way mm -hmm. so that they could justify, uh, so that they could justify the acts that were done at that time. A lot of the kingdoms in those times weren't as concerned with war and conquering as some of their other counterparts in Europe or in Asia. Um, a lot of them were focused on trade. So they see iron and they don't think, oh, I'm going to make a weapon out of this. They think, I'm going to make jewelry and sell this for salt. Anything else in terms of specific uh, fighting techniques and styles? I'll put it to you this way. Have you ever watched the movie The Quest? The Quest? No, I have not. Okay, so it's a Jean-Claude Van Damme movie from the 1990s. Um, this is probably the best explanation that I can give for what the I, what the mentality was about African martial arts. Um, so they have all these, you know, it's one of those typical 90s action movies where a bunch of stereotypes get together and beat each other up for a fancy trophy, right? Hmm. Um, so they bring out, so they had, you know, they had Turkey, Brazil, France, but then they had Africa. So this guy comes out in a loincloth and then there's like a shimmy and then gets clotheslined by the Turkish oil wrestler. So it's... <laughs> 
But so when I when you talk about the about the misconceptions, I think the very idea that martial arts, like a complex system that style from the continent of Africa, just did not exist. And if it did exist, it came from somewhere else. Um, and that's something that uh, that's that as far as techniques are concerned, that is something that we do come across a lot of that we that we came across in the beginning at least. Um, but you know, we've been consistent with the information we provided. We made sure to share our sources with everyone. Mm. Um, you know, and we try to avoid arguing with people. Um, it's more a question of if you're willing to have a conversation, be educated, and look at the sources. We're more than happy to share it with you. There is a video from the Short Blade Symposium where you have mm -hmm. Jesse Tucker from Blood and Iron, who I've actually met and I know is is very a very capable fighter. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, against the Monstith, so I said the the president of the Hama Association, and this yeah. is this is really some really nice fighting. I'm just going to show you a few moments here. I don't know where the audio is going to be at. In fact, I should probably just mute it just in case the audio is way too loud. It could very well be. Well, let's find out. So you see the monster is on the left with the Chotel. Yep. Very nice, fluid uh, footwork here, and, and overall the movements. You, you can just see that these two guys are very experienced and physically fit, and it's it's a very impressive fight. It is. The Daman is amazing to watch. Yeah, really. absolutely. And as I said, his channel will be down below, linked, so you can check that out as well. Here's a really nice example of grappling. So as Jesse closes in for grappling, Daman is holding him off and then striking him in the back with a show tail. That's really nicely done. How much information is there about the the little nuances like grip, for example? Like, you know, how do you hold it? Which finger squeezes and, you know, how you power the cot and all that? Well, a lot of that we get from the living arts. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, with um, Matreg, um, you have uh, two two or three different t ways of gripping the stick, which can be trans which can be transposed to how you would hold a saber. Hmm. So you have the first uh, defensive grip, which is like this. So you have the stick in your hand and then your thumb hmm. bracing it. This is how you would determine your edge alignment for, uh, for your defenses. So this is how you know where your edge is because it would be in line mm -hmm. with, the, uh, with the sharp edge of the blade. Uh, then you have this grip here, which is, I guess you'd call it a pistol grip. Um, and this is how you would hold it forward, and then you have this grip as well, which is a bit of which is a bit of a stronger grip, which you see more in the Turkic styles of mm. uh, Matrek, which you would find in the Ottoman Empire. Um, so there are there are different there are different ways, and and that is we determine that based on how we can see what is in the living traditions, because those oftentimes fill in the gaps for what's missing in the accounts or what might be missing in the text. Um, and a lot of the text, especially from what I've read so far in some of the Mamluk works, is that they they give you principles, they give you basic principles and give you ideas for strategies, but they don't go into too much detail as to this is exactly how you should hold it, mm -hmm. unless they're trying to teach you how to do a particular block while you're riding a horse. And that's quite an advantage to have a living tradition. I mean, in, in Hema, we, for the most part, we don't really have that. I mean, there are... You know, if you if you do saber fencing, even that, I mean, the modern versions of saber fencing are not not really that similar to what was done historically. And mm -hmm. you know, if, if you if you look at Olympic fencing, for example, it's very very different from historical rapier fencing. So you can't really go by that. Long sword, of course, is completely gone. It's just being reconstructed based on the the historical manuals and there's a lot of background information that we just don't have and they, that they didn't see any need to write down because they taught people directly they didn't have to spell out everything yeah okay so this is how you pick it up this is how you hold it this is how the footwork is they just say take a step like step in or pass or something like that they, they are not going to spell it out a lot of the techniques have survived through dance so, for example, uh, the Tuareg have a particular style of dance where they're actually dancing with the sword and shield hmm. and doing a mock duel. 
So you can actually see the proper way of holding the sword, the proper way of holding the shield, how to get the footwork, and you see how they would train the warriors to have the appropriate leg strings to be able mm-hmm. to make the appropriate movements in the battles. Um, with the Zulus and the and the Tosa people, you'll see them doing their stick fighting styles, and the stick fighting styles exist as a cultural institution. So um, you know, you see, so that is a way that a lot of these arts have been able to survive. Um, Tahtib, as I mentioned earlier, um, it survived as a dance because when they could no longer do it as a as a way to fight and uh, and dress up disputes, dance has been able to maintain some of the very basic techniques and give you an idea as to how they would hold it, learning the four principles, etc. Any good sources for Egyptian martial arts? As I mentioned earlier, there is a living tradition called Nuba wrestling, mm. which is which you actually see on the walls of Abu Ser and Beni Hassan, which is still practiced in Sudan today. Hmm. There is actually an international Muba wrestling league. Uh, they call, it's also called Boar Wrestling. It's practiced by the uh, South Sudanese and the Nubians. Um, they, there's, a, there's a team in Calgary, I think. And then there, is, uh, there was an international competition that happened a year or two years ago in Australia. Um, so where you find a lot of Southern Sudanese, you'll find that particular wrestling style. So it still does endure. They even wear some of the same costumes that they do in the Egyptian depictions with the um, with the leopard skin. Well, now they use faux leopard, but hmm. the leopard skin uh, loincloth for the wrestling, the oil, and the ceremony, etc. Um, if you're looking at work for the stick fighting, so Tahtib, as I mentioned earlier, uh, that's also you find the four principles written on the walls of the Abu Ser. Um, so that has at least the four basic principles that you can build on. And then you have accounts and then you know what weapons that can be applied to and then you have the the, the current dance a lot of these are passed on orally so i mean the, those two disciplines do exist um the third discipline of the egyptian warrior was archery uh, with the mm-hmm. angular bow and you do see some cultures some rural cultures in east africa uh, who actually still do use angular bows for leisure hunting or mm-hmm. for pleasure shooting or, or anything like that um so you do see that, um, that that does exist. And then, of course, you have to look at the accounts and then take a look at the different ways of fighting. Uh, we do. We are currently working on a reconstruction of Kopesh fighting. Um, Daman, and, Daman Stiff, president, and our regulations officer, uh, Nick Bulan, uh, those two are sort of our lead Kopesh guys, and they are working on doing some reconstructions so that they'd be able to show, its, uh, show how to use those weapons. Uh, Daman actually is running through his program, through his uh, program in Austin, Texas, uh, in Egyptian fighting uh, system, where they're using the Ikam shield, or those tombstone shields. I wonder if, if you happen to know anything about that. Like this, there's, there's this additional point here. Well, if you if you want to call it a point, you know, near the point of the blade, there's there's this corner. So, question was, uh, would that be used to hook with, slash with, pierce? Do you know anything about that? To be honest, nobody legitimately knows what mm. that's for. Nobody. Um, because it's just not written down. I mean, it could be similar to that false edge on, that you find on a killage, mm-hmm. where it could be used for um, what the Zulus call an umujikiriza, which is a rap, which is a rap shot. Mm-hmm. Um, it could be used for hooking. It could be used for pulling, you know, pulling somebody's guts out. We're really not sure. Mm-hmm. Um, being able to pull a hooking maneuver off, and some of our members have tried it in a sparring match, Pulling off a hooking maneuver with the Kopesh is incredibly difficult. Mm. Um, the setup is tough, and you have to be able to hook and pull and strike in faster than your opponent can react to you hooking their shield. We're not 100% sure. Um, we may figure it out eventually, but it could be anything from stylistic, um, maybe functional to assist with the thrust, or, you know, or, or anything like that. Mm-hmm. The stylistic part, I think, is is easy to undervalue. Like quite often, when we look at the shape of something, we want to find a purpose. We want to find a function. Oh, what was this for? Whereas sometimes, even if you look at uh, European armory, sometimes you look at something. What's this for? Uh, it looks nice because <laughs> sometimes that's that's all they intended. It, there, there isn't always a specific purpose. It's very possible that individual warriors had certain preferences. Here's another question. Uh, how much info is there on mounted combat from Egypt and other African nations? Would Central and Southern African nations have had an equine culture at the same time as places in Europe? That's a really good question. And believe it or not, there is a lot of work 
on uh, equestrian warfare in North Africa. Um, the Mamluk manuals are fantastic because they have, uh, so it's just a background for people who aren't aware of who the Mamluks were. Um, they were a group of slave soldiers that were brought by the, I believe it was the Umayyads or the Abbasids, one of the two, um, into Egypt. And they were trained as sort of an elite fighting force. So imagine Janissaries, but getting treated a little bit better. Um, hmm. A lot of them ended up, you know, getting placed in state. And I think the 12, around the late, the mid 13th century, they actually overthrew the caliphate that was ruling Egypt and made themselves the kings of Egypt uh, at that time. Hmm. Uh, so they actually have quite a few books. There's a book called the Mamluk Manzer, uh, which was published by the University of Oslo, uh, which is a translation of a text that goes into the detail on mounted warfare. So teaching them how to fight with a sword on the back of a horse, how to fight with a lance. Um, and most people would assume that fighting with a lance is very much, you charge at the other person and you stick them with a pointy end, which is what you often see in movies. But um, there are different guards, there are different, um, different ways to circle your opponent. So it goes into detail of how to fight on a horse against a formation of infantry soldiers. You have uh, details on how to fight against other mounted soldiers. You have details on how to um, on how to change from one weapon to the other, which weapon should be used in which scenario. Um, there's actually a diagram that shows you the pattern for how you charge in from, say you're charging in from their left flank strafing across firing your arrows and then moving across so there's also mounted archery as well hmm. um and that similar style uh, what's important to note is that the mamluks were often hired out as mercenaries to train soldiers for example one of the kings of ethiopia hired uh mamluk deserters to train his army on equine warfare um you have the kanembordu who passed their knowledge down one generation to the other, but they were noted. There's actually uh, an article written by, I wish I could remember all of the names, but there was British, um, a British explorer, colonizer, soldier, whatever title you want to ascribe to him, but he took a, took a record of some of these men doing their equine exercises in West Africa. And uh, basically they were just, uh, and he was impressed at how well they were able to manipulate their lances while on the backs of their horses. And you see that all throughout North Africa, you see it in West Africa, as well as in uh, East Africa. The Sudanese had a very strong equine culture as well. Um, and you find that, uh, I believe it was about the Battle of Omerdun in the 19th century, was a cavalry, was primarily a cavalry battle. Hmm. Um, in Central Africa, you don't really see a lot of horses. And that's simply because the terrain just doesn't make it conducive to the warfare. Um, the jungles are very thick. A lot of the land is impassable. Um, some of the people just were not trading. This actually looks a lot like you would see in uh, European martial arts as well. The sort of what, what would be called a hanging parry in Hema. Mm -hmm. I mean, it makes a lot of sense since it is also a double-edged straight sword. So yeah. you would see there are certain similarities that you see based on the weapon and the simple fact that human anatomy is the same. So there, there are only so many techniques and, and strategies that you can effectively use, basically. Absolutely. So what you're seeing is uh, Devon Stith doing some sparring with the Tacoba, which is a sword that is uh, more popularly associated with the, uh, with the Tuareg. Um, and other peoples along the Sahel and the Sahara. Um, the block that he's doing is uh, is very similar to the the fourth guard that you'll find in um, in an art called Al Matreg, hmm. um, and it's the usual guard that's used for for guarding the head. So if somebody's striking above, above your head for that, um, it's you can use it to either guard your head and move offline, or you can hmm. also use it to guard your head and shoot in. Yes, so this is Al Um So this is sort of the template for almost every sword form you find in North Africa and the Sahara is from this stick form. Hmm. Um, so what he's showing are the just the basic targets for the for the art. Now you'll notice a couple of things that he always reverts to guarding the head. And mm -hmm. a lot of this, a, a major reason for this is because uh, one of the major priorities of most African martial arts, especially in the North, 
is protecting your head. Yeah. Um, this is because not a lot of guys can afford helmets. And I mean, would you want to wear a metal helmet in the middle of the desert? I'm yeah. pretty sure you wouldn't. No. Um, so a lot of these guys would be wearing turbans or some of them wouldn't have any head covering at all. Or sometimes the turbans might fall off in combat. And if somebody hits you in your head, that's it. Same in HEMA. It's uh, a lot of the techniques are essentially do this and then strike him in the head or strike him you know, through the face or whatever. It's just that's one of the easiest ways to immediately incapacitate somebody. Anyway, so it looks like there are no more questions coming in and we've covered a lot of information. So I think we can we can leave it at this. Perfect. Well, thank so, you very much for, uh, for having me on. I, I appreciate this and the council really appreciates this. Yeah, thank you so much for doing the video with me. It was it was really interesting to talk about this. And I wouldn't mind doing that again at some point, you know, talking about you know, specific parts of Hama, maybe individual styles and techniques and mm -hmm. tactics. And thank you. We'd be more than happy to uh, perhaps maybe another member of the council might be uh, might be available and uh mm -hmm. you know you could interview two of us <laughs> yeah absolutely that, that would be pretty awesome so yeah thanks again adam and uh thanks everybody who, who showed up and watched this and all of that so have Thank a good you one for having us and you have a great day you too